Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the new director of the uh, uh, John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today for a discussion on the results of Israel's election, which occurred yesterday and uh, um, which held some, uh, some real surprises for us. I think it's been a widely held assumption in um, public policy circles, in the press, and uh, in the Israeli public that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu would cruise to a uh, to re-election uh, with an even stronger majority uh, in the in the Knesset than he had had before. That Israelis uh, had felt uh, buffeted by what we have called the Arab Spring, but what they believe to be the Arab Nightmare, and that uh, there was no longer any uh, desire to uh, support a strong uh, candidate pushing for a peace process process uh, with um, the Palestinians or for a greater rapprochement with Israel's neighbors. Uh, in the event, however, Netanyahu uh, appears to have had a, an experience much like his previous experiences running uh, for office in that he came up uh, a lot shorter in the end than everyone expected and yet somehow still uh, in the winner's uh, seat. And uh, the uh, papers now are referring to the results as being 60 in the right-wing camp and 60 in the uh, center-left camp, putting Israel in a very, very uh, interesting position as it tries to build a coalition. Uh, the implications of this for the peace process are quite open, and uh, it will be interesting to see how the region uh, receives this news and what kind of reaction it may elicit from Palestinians and others. To walk us through some of these developments, I'm delighted to welcome Stephen Simon to uh, Dartmouth and to the Dickey Center to uh, analyze the events. Um, since uh, I think they were so surprising, um, I'm going to give him uh, my own personal measure of uh, leeway. and. Uh, suggests that there's an awful lot that's still up for grabs. Steve Simon is a uh, very good, very old friend of mine and uh, also uh, one of Washington's uh, wisest and most experienced analysts of the Middle East. He is now uh, executive director of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, the London-based corollary, it's often said, to the Council on Foreign Relations. And he is here as its uh, US and corresponding director uh, for, um, for the U.S. and for the Middle East based in Washington. Um, until the very end of last year, he served in the White House as the president's advisor on the Middle East. Uh, for those of you in the know, he was uh, senior director uh, on the National Security Council for the Middle East and North Africa region, and thus was uh, not just a witness, but a participant in some of the most exciting events uh, that have occurred in the Middle East and the North Africa in more than half a century. Uh, prior to uh, re-entering government, uh, Steve had uh, worked for uh, the Good Harbor Corp Company as a uh, advisor uh, to the uh, Royal Court in uh, Abu Dhabi. He had also been uh, for a long time a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, I'm, uh, I'd like to say that he's uh, one of the very, very best analysts of contemporary terrorism as well, and that was why I decided I'd write two books with him. Um, and uh, he spent many years on the National Security Council and in the State Department uh, before uh, coming back to uh, uh, the White House, uh, this time around in the Obama administration. Um, you have seen, I hope, his bio on our website. Uh, if I were to recite it all, we'd be here for quite a long time. Uh, but I'd like to turn the floor over to Steve now, and he can uh, analyze some very, very interesting and surprising results from Israel. Thank you very much. Oh, wow, I can get on eBay from here. <laughs> this is great. I'll try not to get too distracted. Um, let me start off by just asking uh, how many people in the room um, know what the election results were. Because if, if there's not a lot who do, I'll go through them. Looks like about, oh, almost everybody. Okay. Um, so 
Do you know the ways in which it was surprising? I mean, basically, there was the ascendance of two politicians um, who hadn't really been thought to be on the, uh, you know, the leading edge or the the wave front uh, of Israeli politics. This is in part because, as many of you probably know in Israeli politics, you know, the public is scrupulously honest to poll takers. And then they get to the election booth and they lie like hell. <laughs> and uh, that's, what, uh, that's what happened here. The two uh, politicians in particular who had come to the fore are Naftali Bennett, who actually made it um, to uh, a New Yorker profile, which is, that's real transcendence. I mean, that's, you know, the guy's made it. Um, he's made it in other ways as well that I'll get into in a second. But the, um, the other politician was a journalist named Yair Lapid. And uh, he actually comes from a maverick family, a political maverick family. I don't know if that's really a term. But um, his father, uh, Tommy uh, Lapid, had started his own party uh, way back, almost 20 years ago now. And um, that was a kind of a flash in the pan. But uh, he was, um, that is, Tommy was at that point seen as, uh, you know, the avatar of a new center to Israeli politics that was becoming increasingly uh, polarized. Anyway, that didn't come to anything. But now his, his son, um, uh, who, uh, you know, had been, I guess, kind of a more of a, when I say journalist, I don't mean, you know, like the kind of journalist that writes a 600-page book about Dick Cheney. Um, you know, I'm talking about kind of a TV journalist. That's what, that's what he did. And um, one of the reasons he wasn't expected to do well, um, uh, in part um, because... Well, one of the reasons he wasn't expected to do well, apart from his reputation of just being a very vapid person. And in fact, um, one commentator referred to him as the perfect example of vapid centrism. Um, is it, he just really never said anything about his positions on anything except for sort of vague prescriptions about greater income equality, um, and uh, what looked like a pretty um, a clear effort to exploit what had become a big social movement in Israel, kind of like an Occupy Wall Street phenomenon, except it was transplanted to a central square in Tel Aviv called um, Dizengoff, Dizengoff Square, which actually is round, now that I think of it. Um, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, so... Um, uh, this guy, Lapid, turned out to be a real force. And, you know, I was looking back at some of his speeches before I came up here. And, uh, you know, I just thought they were actually really powerful speeches. And I never, I, 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 I haven't uh, to this day actually seen him uh, deliver uh, one of these speeches. But, um, you know, even reading them is kind of a stirring experience. I mean, they're really rabble-rousing, um, mud-raking uh, speeches. I mean, they're, they're really demagogic. And again, I don't know how good his delivery was, but the words were really something. You know, he'd start out with a refrain of, who owns Israel? And then he'd go through all the great pillars of Israeli society and say, does, does this group, uh, does this elite own Israel? And then, you know, he'd kind of go through a little um, a disquisition about the evils of that group. And then he'd say, no, they don't own it, you own it. And then he'd go on to the next group, whether it was the army or the business-making elite or those who were in power in government. Um, it really um, uh, quite powerful, and, and looking back on those speeches, I can sort of see how, well, you know, at the end of the day, looking at the sort of poor range of choices available to Israeli voters, he might have looked a lot better than, um, uh, you know, he did uh, to outside observers. And clearly, you know, judging by the poll results leading up to the elections, uh, he was kind of a last-minute choice for a lot of Israelis who, again, just looked at the available, you know, selection, and she said, well, uh, you know, I guess it's Lapid. Um, 
The, the other guy who did unexpectedly well, although not, not as well as some people thought he was going to do, was this person I referred to named Naftali Bennett, who was um, American-born, as his name suggests, um, very bright, made a lot of money uh, in, um, as, a, as part of a startup, you know, data manipulation of some kind. Um, and uh, there were a lot of fingers in that pie. I think he made about the, the deal that, that they struck that made him wealthy, netted about uh, $20 million, of which he got a couple of million after everyone else was paid off. You know, the lawyers, the investors, and the accountants, and everybody else. But anyway, that's not nothing. And combined, um, and, and the aura of business success that this conferred on him, combined with his military uh, uh, career, he had been uh, a commando, and that is good for at least, you know, 20 percentage points in any poll for any Israeli politician. Um, they really, uh, they sort of really like that. Um, anyway, he had been a commando, so that was, uh, that was really something. He's also quite eloquent. Um, what he has to say is objectionable to many uh, people, um, and, and maybe even many people in this room, but nevertheless, um, he's quite eloquent when he makes his points about um, uh, Israel being for Israelis, uh, the need to uh, annex uh, the West Bank, uh, which would entail probably the expulsion of at least some of its um, uh, Arab population. Uh, and a very kind of hard line on security issues generally. He showed, um, you know, uh, that he's got some robust support. Um, now, while they did very well, other parties uh, did not do all that well, particularly uh, the Labor Party, which um, uh, I have uh, my, my um, number is 15 seats, which is quite low. Now, there, there are other um, center-left parties that, um, uh, you know, that didn't get completely wiped out, but um, some of them, like Kadima, uh, very nearly did. That was the party that <clears throat> was originally set up by uh, Ariel Sharon a number of years ago, but premised on the need to get out of the occupied territories. And that was headed uh, initially by, well, after he left by Tsipi Livni most recently, who went on to found a different party, um, uh, Hatnua, which you know, managed to get six seats. Um, uh, and then there's Meretz, which is a uh, left-wing labor party that got six seats. So I mean, when you add all these up, you still have a not, you know, it's not, it's not an, an entirely insubstantial number of uh, left ish uh, players in uh, the new Knesset, but um, uh, not a very impressive showing. There were other parties, by the way, that there were three, three left-wing parties that didn't make it above the threshold uh, at all. So what is Netanyahu supposed to do with this? Um, he's, he's kind of in a quandary uh, because he's got to form a government, and he's got to form a government that it will be at least relatively stable. There are two parties that um, will be very, two sets of parties that will be very difficult to kind of put into the same frame. There's the Yair Lapid party, which staked out a position on the draft for Orthodox Jews in Israel that is very unpopular with Orthodox Jews because it means that if, if, if his policy became Israeli government policy, Orthodox Jews would have to serve in the army, which they don't really like to do for a lot of reasons. And they've been protected from serving in the army since the days of Ben-Gurion. So um, trying to put the religious parties, which are a natural ally, a historic ally of Likud and Netanyahu's party, 
uh, into the same government as this new ascendant Yair Lapid party. That doesn't you know, seem like it's going to work that well. And trying to mix um, uh, leftish parties like Labor, for example, into the same cabinet as Natalie Bennett's party. Uh, is also going to be really problematic because they're just, they're such polar opposites. Well, Netanyahu is talking now about establishing a very, very broad government, not a national unity government. He's not going to get there, but he's going to try and pull as many of the parties together into a government as possible under his leadership. It's going to be very awkward because it means that the coalition rules that will have to be agreed upon will necessarily be lowest common denominator. So you'll have kind of a Star Wars bar cabinet, um, a, you know, very diverse, uh, a lot of very different uh, and even clashing agendas. Um, and, uh, you know, politicians populating the cabinet uh, who are out simply to maximize, uh, you know, their own votes in the next election rather than to work in lockstep with their partners and the prime minister in forging a way ahead. So we're talking about a pretty uh, messy election. Now, there are a couple of other things about the election campaign I wanted to mention before I just go into what I think the um, implications are. That will be very short. Um, issues that we think are hugely important never came up in the campaign. So you have Israel looking at this uh, Iranian threat that until uh, the election season began, uh, the prime minister was um, uh, really seized with. He'd given the warning, he'd given the world a warning uh, about Israeli intentions to attack Iran uh, in front of the UN General Assembly. He gave that warning. That was in uh, September of last year. He uh, felt strongly enough about it to directly challenge the President of the United States. Um, a very risky thing to do. Uh, not unprecedented, but risky thing to do for an Israeli Prime Minister. I mean, this was a really important issue. Never arose in the campaign. Uh, the transformation of Egypt and the challenge that that poses to Israeli interests and arguably its security, uh, no, nothing, nothing. And the peace process and the situation of the Palestinians and the deteriorating, deteriorating relationship between Israelis and Palestinians, nothing. They just didn't, they just didn't come up. And, um, you know, that creates some questions about the extent to which they're going to come up once the government is formed. Because if you have all these parties who competed for a slice of the pie, and none of them really felt like uh, these security issues were worth campaigning on, and in fact, you know, if you look at the Labor Party, this is a great example of what I'm talking about or what I'm trying to explain. The Labor Party, this is the party of Ben-Gurion, Yitzhak Rabin, Shimon Peres, Ehud Barak, these are the, the lions of uh, Israeli history. They, they fashion the state, they carve the state out of the hostile terrain of the Middle East. All labor and all intensively focused on security issues and the position of Israel in the region. Well, the Labor Party now has walked away from all those issues. And it's lashed itself up to the same set of issues that caused Yair Lapid to rise so high in Israeli politics. And, that, and those are bread and butter issues. Um, you know, income inequality, uh, rising housing prices, uh, uh, prices of household goods, things like that. That's, that's what that, the leader of that party, Shelly Yachimovich, who was also a former um, uh, uh, you know, TV talk show host, actually. Um, that's, what, that's what she focused on. So if the one party that you would normally have expected uh, to focus on these issues had just walked away from them entirely. Now, there are some other, um, 
some other issues. Um, that I, I think we need to talk about for a couple of minutes before we you know, transition to the question of implications. And these are just some details about attitudes that characterize the Israeli electorate. Actually, I'm not just going to talk about the electorate. I'm going to talk a little bit about the attitudes of Israeli youths. And um, they're now turning into the object for polling efforts, uh, particularly the age cohort between high school and the army, which is to say tomorrow's voters. OK, so first, um, uh, the electorate largely would sign on to the idea of a peace process. I mean, despite the absence of this as an issue for the election, 59% uh, in the most recent polling on this, um, uh, on this issue, 59% of Israelis say they want a two-state solution. I'm obviously going to get to a catch here in a second, but um, I'll try to be systematic and not get ahead of myself. Uh, and 52% and of Likud voters say that they want a two-state solution. So, you know, you get some backing uh, in Israel, at least notionally, uh, for a two-state solution. Now, 70% say, and, and, and Naftali Bennett rides this wave, 70% say that whatever solution emerges must be one that preserves the Jewish character of the state. So you really need to have a Jewish state. And that's become a big issue now in Israel-Palestinian negotiating terms. We can talk about that later. OK, now here's the interesting thing. The catch-22 is that 67% of Jewish Israelis, 61% overall, but 67% of Jewish Israelis don't see Israel as an actor in that equation. In other words, they don't see what Israel does or doesn't do as relevant to the, this two-state solution outcome. So there's a self-conception of Israel in this, um, uh, in this situation as a completely passive actor. So it's acted upon, but it doesn't, it doesn't act. The same percentage of uh, poll respondents uh, in this set of polling also says that as much as, of course, they want a two-state solution, uh, there is, quote, unquote, no, no chance of progress for the foreseeable future. That's linked to this notion of Israel as passive because, you know, one might say, well, what could Israel do to change that um, to change that assessment of prospects for success. But, you know, in the back, there's this feeling that, well, there's nothing that we can do uh, to, to change that. Now, uh, closer to the election theme here are a couple of other statistics that I think are important. One is that 55% of all Israelis, um, Jewish Israelis, self-identify as right-wing. And that number has been climbing. 21% uh, describe themselves as center, and 17% describe themselves as of the left. So um, Israeli society, in terms of its attitudes, and people might, and when they answer that question, construe right or left in, in maybe slightly different terms, so um, uh, we can't be completely confident in, in the specific meaning here. But the general impression one gets is of an electorate that's moving to the right. Now, in tandem with this, 50% uh, of all the uh, respondents in recent pollings, when they're asked the question of uh, whether Netanyahu is to be followed on security issues, even if it means confrontation with the United States, 50% of, of respondents say yes. Now, that's not entirely shocking because um, longitudinal polling going back decades um, shows that 
uh, a steady 60% of respondents say that, you know, when the prime minister issues a, um, a, you know, a policy on a, an important security issue, well, then, you know, that's the one to go with because it's the prime minister who's, who's got the first and last word um, on that. Now, let's look at the next generation. There, last... Um, I guess it was the summer of 2011, two big polls came out that were quite interesting. One was uh, conducted by the Friedrich uh, Ebert Stiftung uh, in Germany and the other by Agar um, Mochot, uh, which is an Israeli polling uh, firm. And these, these polls were conducted separately but of the same population, that is the between high school and, and, uh, and army. Um, uh, cohort. And what they found was uh, diminishing confidence in political institutions, uh, diminishing um, uh, interest in democracy as a political arrangement, um, uh, in, uh, a stronger uh, uh, interest in the importance of a strong leader as uh, an organizing principle of, of political activity. And um, uh, there was a split down the middle uh, in the Ma'agar Mochot poll between those respondents who said that it was okay for Israeli Arabs to be elected to parliament, to Knesset, and those who felt that actually that shouldn't happen that um, Israeli Arabs should not be eligible uh, to um, uh, serve as elected uh, members of the Knesset. So um, you, you see a kind of rightward turn among the youth uh, as well. So um, when I say, as I'm about to say, uh, that um, the government that Netanyahu forms uh, will not have a very long shelf life, it may collapse within two years because the internal contradictions uh, will be um, uh, uh, you know, quite severe and possibly not sustainable in the face of exogenous pressures um, uh, that might uh, emerge over the next couple of years. When I say that that government doesn't, you know, won't last all that long and there will be another election, uh, we're talking about the poll respondents, the youth poll respondents that I've just talked about um, being eligible voters for the first time. They'll be entering um, uh, the electorate. So I think it's, it, it would probably be prudent not to assume that uh, there will be developments within Israeli society that will reverse the rightward trend, which is going to continue to favor a certain um, uh, a government uh, structures, uh, certain government compositions, and um, and policy outcomes. So, uh, what does this mean, uh, you know, for the issues that are really, um, you know, important to uh, you know to us? Peace process. Um, the election results probably mean nothing's going to happen, um, uh, in the sense of openings emerging over the next uh, couple of years that would give a U.S. administration some purchase. Uh, that seems to be unlikely. And it's worth remembering, too, that you, know, you look at a government um, such as the one that's likely to result from the intensive bargaining that's going to take place over the next month. Um, and you think, is this a government um, and is this a, um, a Knesset that Netanyahu would see as providing sufficient backing for cooperation in some kind of um, peace effort vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians? And here, you know, it's worth recalling that uh, Yitzhak Rabin, when he was prime minister and he went to Oslo, remember the Oslo Accords and all that, um, the last sort of big advance in the peace process, he had the backing of 44 labor ministers and I think 12 Meretz ministers, another flavor of labor. Um, he had a lot of serious backing. 
in, there's no conceivable shakeout from this election that would provide Bibi Netanyahu with the equivalent sort of backing. So I don't really see that. Um, second, uh, Israelis feel themselves to be very encircled, you know, at this point, and that's that's got them in a very deep crouch. You know, my first week on the job, I must have had a hundred Israeli visitors. My first week on this last job at the White House, um, because you know the is the Israelis are very adept at working the system in ways that um, uh, Arabs aren't. So, you know, in my portfolio, I had one Jewish country, and I had, you know, like 12 Arab countries, and um, uh, I almost never had uh, a visitor from one of the Arab countries that was in my portfolio, but I had a steady stream of Israelis. Anyway, um, they showed up uh, uh, in a you know, in a pretty steady and robust stream. And they all had exactly the same story to tell, which was difficult, really, to gainsay any sense. They said, look, you have Hezbollah in Lebanon, you have the Muslim brothers in Egypt, um, you have in, um, a burgeoning uh, brotherhood presence in Jordan. Jordan will inevitably fall. Um, uh, to, uh, to the brothers. You have a war in Syria that's almost certainly going to result uh, in um, uh, some kind of extremist Sunni regime. So, you know, they'd say, well, we're, we're just surrounded. You know, we've got radical Sunnis on three sides and radical Shia on the fourth side. And Outside of our immediate perimeter, we've got uh, Iran, which is a strategic adversary and uh, you know, pursuing nuclear weapons that could have only one conceivable purpose, and that's to attack Israel. So um, you know, their, their worldview right now um, is such that it's difficult to see them striking a deal with Palestinians, because to them that would entail risks, especially now that um, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem have been hit by rockets fired by Palestinians. So um, you don't have the right kind of government, and you don't have the right kind of um, mindset. Two very big barriers. And, uh, you know, on the U.S. side, you really don't have um, a president uh, who uh, is eager to um, uh, join a battle uh, with the Israelis, I think, at this point, over the peace process, in part because the Palestinian side of that equation appears to be unready. The Palestinian side needs things before it goes into negotiations that Israelis are not going to provide. You know, and whether that is a settlement freeze or it's a territorial guarantee of some kind, you know, a commitment to the 67 borders with swaps, which has been, you know, part of the discourse now for the past couple of years. Palestinians want to get something up front I can sympathize with this, um, actually, but it's unlikely that they're going to get it. And the Palestinian situation is complicated even, even more, I mean, tragically, really, by the split territorially, politically, and in an emerging sense, culturally, between the West Bank and Gaza. Now, there I'll just, um, I, I think I'm going to stop there, but just leave you all with a, with a thought that, you know, on the Palestinian side, the only interesting development that you could point to was some kind of, you know, perverse expectation or anticipation is this tacit Israeli shift in terms of dealing with Palestinians 
to dealing with Hamas instead of Fatah. Instead of, that is to say, um, dealing with the uh, religious nationalists uh, in Gaza as against the secular uh, nationalists in the West Bank. And, you know, this is something that's, I mean, it's a very peculiar thing, but if you look at everything the Israelis have done uh, recently, it's strengthened Hamas and weakened Fatah. It's strengthened the religious nationalists in Gaza and weakened uh, the leftists in the West Bank. And most recently, um, even in, and paradoxically, even in the context of the Gaza conflict that just took place, I mean, what emerged was um, serious and intensive trilateral diplomacy between a Likud government in Israel, a Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt, and a Hamas government in Gaza, uh, leaving the West Bank and the leadership there, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, completely out in the cold. So, you know, this might be a straw in the wind um, of change that might emerge over the course of the next couple of years, but it's not going to happen and no change is going to happen directly as a result, in my view, of these um, a purely ad interim election results. That's it, I'll take questions. Well, um, Steve, thanks for uh, some fairly brilliant analysis. And um, uh, I can now say that the difference between uh, being inside in Hanover and being outside in Hanover on January 23rd is that outside the sun was shining. <laughs> um, uh, a lot to chew on. Let me, um, I'm gonna ask two questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna abuse the prerogative, not just once, but twice. Um, Question number one, to what extent do you think that the election results reflect um, uh, or suggest that the essential issue for Israelis now is actually secularism versus religion uh, and the desire to end all of those uh, special privileges uh, that the ultra-Orthodox had? Um, uh, that's question number one. Question number two is, um, during the period the election campaign was going on and even beforehand, uh, some very big, um, some heavyweights in the Israeli security world attacked Netanyahu uh, for his posture vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And my question is, did that have any impact whatsoever and is there any uh, serious debate now on uh, how to go forward on Iran um, that has in any way been affected by the election? Uh, are, th are things changing? Um, you know, what's the, uh, what's the situation? Okay. Um, Do you want me to call on people after that? Yeah, or? sure. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, on the first question, it's not, it's not secular versus religious. Um, per se. It's not secular versus religious per se. Um, uh, and I'll tell you why I say that. Uh, first is that in the polling, especially youth polling, the question is asked, does Judaism, does the Jewish religion have an important role to play in our country? And over 70% of the respondents say yes. So um, uh, the, the significance of religion um, uh, and, its, uh, and the respect in which religion is held, I think is um, pretty high uh, in Israel. Now, what there, but what there is, is a real resentment against the ultra-Orthodox. You know, the people with the beards and the side locks and black hats and, and so forth. Uh, because they are seen as a parasitic element in Israeli society. And um, uh, there are, 
a number of advocacy groups uh, in Israel now that have uh, taken it upon themselves to educate the Israeli public. Um, but it's the Israeli public sort of like, uh, you know, people who read, you know, op-eds and things like that, uh, and also educate um, Knesset members about the huge opportunity cost uh, to the Israeli economy of subsidizing uh, the ultra-Orthodox uh, communities. And there, I say communities because there's more than just one ultra-Orthodox community, although they're all, um, they share a lot of things uh, in common. So... Uh, there's resentment against the ultra-Orthodox, but there's not a split on religious versus, versus secular. Uh, there are other ways to parse, you know, some of these numbers, but I mean, we'll, we'll, I can come back to that uh, later. On, on the Iran debate, um, uh, distinguished... Um, Israeli uh, intelligence officers and former military officers have come out, you know, very strongly against the idea of Israel attacking um, uh, Iran to set its nuclear program back by however long it would set its nuclear program back by attacking it. Um, and and when we read about uh, the debate that these guys are trying to to spur uh, uh, in Israeli society in, writ large and in the parliament uh, more narrowly, we kind of think, oh, this has to make a real difference. And then I think, as only somebody who lives, uh, who works, that is, within the Beltway in Washington uh, would, would think, which is of Nunn, Perry, Schultz, and Kissinger. These are uh, former secretaries of state and defense who are on a tear about um, uh, zero growth in nuclear arsenals and just building, building downward and ultimately disarming ourselves in a coordinated way uh, with the Russians, um, disarming ourselves of, of our nuclear capability. Now, these guys, I mean, Henry Kissinger, Schultz, Perry, Sam Nunn, I mean, these guys are serious, but who cares? Um, you know, they could be, uh, you know, shouting this from the rooftops and it really wouldn't make a difference because, you know, in countries like ours, from a certain perspective, distinguished statesmen, when they retire, just, they all go off half cocked. Now, <laughs> I'm not saying that that's how I view it necessarily, but you know, you, you have to sort of look at Israeli society and they see guys like Meir Dagan, who had been head of the Mossad, or some of these former generals, and, and they say, well, we should learn to live with an, with an Iranian nuclear weapon. And you know, the Israelis listen to that and go, man, they retire and they go nuts. <laughs> anyway. That's a... Okay, on that note, let's open it up to the floor. Questions? Please, Dale. Yeah. Um, there, there's one part of the Israeli electorate, um, thank you very much for your talk, Steve, that you haven't talked about, and that is the, uh, the Israeli Arab citizens. Um, I was very surprised a few years ago at Bar Ilan University to see a significant number of um, Arab Muslims extremely comfortable at the university and a number of them tried to explain to me, within my limits, uh, the importance of the Arab vote uh, linking up, especially with some of the Arab Orthodox groups. What happened to the Arab vote this time? Well, they actually have a, another party uh, that contested in this election, Balad, um, uh, that won a couple of seats. Uh, so they've got three parties. They've got a United Arab List, and they've got the Communists, the Hadash Party, and this Balad um, uh, Party. And, you know, together they've got, wait a second, I've got the number here. I'll give you the, the total. And I'm going to, and I want to give you the total for, for a specific reason. Um, oh, here it is. Uh, 12 seats, 12 mandates. Um, 
in Parliament, which is not nothing. But see, the thing is that those 12 seats don't translate into an operationally effective political presence because no Israeli, no Israeli Jewish party can enter into a coalition with them because such a party would be stigmatized. Am I right? Have they linked up with the Orthodox, some of the Orthodox leading parties in the past? Or? No, they Nature just, Karta. there's, there's the Nature Karta, which is in there. Uh, the the Nature Karta means the keepers of the gate in Aramaic, and it's just, um, it's, they are, they are the farthest, farthest right of the ultra-Orthodox, and they do not believe that um, God willed the creation of the state of Israel, and therefore they reject its authority and its legitimacy. So you can see how some Israeli Arabs might think that there was something to work with. Um, but so that's the Nature Karta. The, but the thing is, because you know, the Israeli left would be pilloried for allying itself with Arab parties, um, they can't form a coalition with them. And because if they did, in some parallel universe where such a thing might happen, it could really affect um, you know, the shape of Israeli politics, but it's not possible. Yes, right here. Up until relatively recently, uh, Israeli governments tended not to last very long. Do you expect this uh, current government to like, maintain the stability that the Yahoo governments have had or to collapse pretty quickly? Well, the, the experts are giving it two years which is actually, you know, it's not a bad guess because it's more or less the pattern of Israeli politics, you know, going back to the late 70s. Well, no, going back to the early 80s. It's more or less the, the pattern. Governments last two years, three at the outside. The, um, the duration of Netanyahu's term, the one that just, you know, came to an end when he called for elections uh, last fall, was anomalous. So I think you know we're probably back to a more normal pattern of uh, short-lived governments that you know just don't have uh, enough uh, internal cohesion in terms of ideology, uh, programmatic um, uh, desiderata, and all that. It's just, it's just it's not enough to hold it together. And then there's some pressure from the outside that 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 happens, or sometimes internally generated pressure, and it just comes apart. Please. Pursuing the Iran question a bit further, you said that this did not come up as an issue in the election campaign. You also said that, in general, the Israeli populace follows its leader, whoever the leader is. So if things should heat up with Iran uh, for whatever reason, but over the nuclear issue, of course, would there be any resistance from the population to taking strong action against Iran? Well, you know, I'll go out on a limb um, and say probably not. You know, if things um, are really heated up, let's say because um, the Iranian regime unleashed a barrage of statements that appeared to be very threatening, you know, really indicating seriously hostile intent, um, uh, and um, the efforts of the five plus one, you know, the European and American um, and Russian uh, effort to get the Iranians to back away from their program, if it continued to prove unavailing, I think at that point, then uh, uh, there probably wouldn't be that much pushback uh, if Netanyahu and his national security team went out there and said, well, you know, we probably have to do something about this. I want to follow that up, if I may. Was the, was the issue of um, Netanyahu's apparent bad relationship with Obama and the thought that this was something that was uh, dangerous for Israel, was that in any way uh, raised? Did it have any impact? Did the argument have any traction whatsoever in the election? 
Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, many of you are probably aware of the Jeff Goldberg interview with, uh, with Obama of a couple of weeks ago. Well, less than a couple of weeks ago, like a week and a half Last ago. Week. Last week. How many people know of it? In a show of hands. Oh, so it's not, it's not well known. Um, Jeff Goldberg uh, is a reporter, um, a columnist, really, for The Atlantic uh, and for a couple of other uh, insalubrious outlets like foreignpolicy.com. And uh, that's just a joke, of course. Um, uh, and, um, and he's interviewed Obama a couple of times, and he uh, just did. And um, although the uh, resulting publication just had one direct quote uh, from the president in it uh, to the effect that Israelis don't know what their own um, national interest is. He's, he was also characterized by Goldberg um, he, as, as, as thinking of Netanyahu as a coward who is, um, you know, controlled by the settler lobby. Well, these are fighting words, but, you know, some people think it was payback time, uh, and the president waited until a particularly delicate moment in the election process to slip BB the shiv. Whatever the case, um, the last poll of the election, because you know, Israelis don't allow polling the week before the election, so the last poll before the election came right after... Um, uh, like 48 hours after the president's uh, interview had been publicized and enough time for it to appear in all the Israeli papers. And in that, uh, in that poll, uh, Lee Kud was down three seats from the previous poll, from before the Obama. Now, you could say sunspots, um, you know, there are a lot of explanations uh, for this drop of three seats. Um, you know, like that, and uh, and the way the seats broke is two went to the left and one went to Naftali Bennett's party, this real right winger. Um, but uh, I'd I'd have thought that the the president, whose views really do count for something uh, in Israel, uh, had an impact on on Netanyahu, who had been attacked uh, during the campaign um, uh, by others. You know, particularly Ehud Olmert, who, who didn't run, um, a, a well-known Israeli politician who'd been a prime minister, you know, already, and even by Ehud Barak, uh, the, the 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 former defense minister, both criticized Netanyahu for, you know, playing dangerous games with the relationship with the United States, which is seen by most Israelis to be um, uh, a strategic. Um, you know, a vital strategic interest of, of Israel. So I think, you know, there's some, some effect. Back there. This is a question that is meant to direct the Israeli psychology to outline about seeing themselves surrounded. It seems fairly self evident. Why is it that that psychology translates to what appears to be a kind of Fatalism. We're surrounded, what can we do? Rather than we're surrounded, it's not going to get better, isn't this the time? Did I make that into a question? Just r raise your voice towards the end of the sentence, and it will count as a question. Um, uh, no, I've, I've asked myself that uh, a lot, uh, because there have been periods in Israeli history when uh, its leadership has been very audacious and uh, believed itself capable of shaping uh, its strategic environment. Um, well, I'll give you a good kind of ironic example. Um, in, the, uh, in the diaries of Moshe Sharet, who had been a foreign minister of, of Israel in the 1950s and had been a close associate of of Ben Gurion, he talks about um, Ben Gurion um, 
uh, conceiving of a deal that he would make with the Syrians to split Lebanon between Syria and Israel. And Israel would put um, some Lebanese officer, Ben-Gurion thought, even a major, of course, thinking, raising thoughts retrospectively of Major Haddad, who had been you know, the Lebanese armed forces, the Christian uh, army officer whom the Israelis had put in charge of southern Lebanon after the war for Galilee in 82. But anyway, the point is, he had Ben-Gurion thinking boldly about splitting up another Middle Eastern country between Israel and an Arab neighbor. Now, you know, okay, I, I conceded that this was an ironical example, but, you know, to me it's all the more powerful because it shows an Israeli leader really thinking um, in uh, terms of, you know, colossal audacity about shaping Israel's environment to improve its security. And here, you know, you have um, uh, an Israeli government that is, um, it, it sees itself as, as really a passive uh, actor here and unable to do anything significantly to improve its, uh, uh, its environment. You know, You know, I would ask my visitors when they kind of laid this, this out um, whether, you know, they thought there was anything Israel could do, you know, proactively to shape things. And um, I only, I, and, and the answer I got, uh, with one exception, um, uh, with the exception of one visitor, was, you know, we really, we, we have to hunker down and we have to weather this storm and we can't take any chances. And I, and I got this one other visitor who had just been named to a very senior military intelligence post. And um, he outlined the same strategic vision for me, surrounded, big trouble. Um, and I asked him the question I asked everybody, which is, well, so what do you do? And he said, make deals. <laughs> That's what he said. Now, I'd, I'd since worked with him, you know, quite intensively on various things um, uh, in the ensuing uh, couple of years, and he's not singing that tune anymore. Um, there's a certain uniformity um, that... This happens in the United States, too, in our own government, a uniformity of view that's imposed. But uh, it was just, it was such an interesting response on this person's uh, uh, part to this, uh, to this question about what to do. So there are alternative conceptions. But for, for now, I think there's, there's a wall-to-wall -wall, uh, consensus imposed or otherwise, um, you know, on... on uh, on the Israeli um, <coughs> policy-making elite that the thing to do is to hunker down. Daryl, I greatly enjoyed your talk. Thank you for coming. Um, with, with respect to that question, is, is it also possible that the, that the view among centrists and maybe to the moderate left in Israel on this issue um, about how to deal with the, the storm outside the borders and the links to the occupied territories is that most of them think that there's not much connection in the sense that the trends that led to the changes in Egypt and the rise of the Brotherhood there, the trends that, de that threatened Jordan that you described, the things that are going on in Syria and the continued various nightmares in Lebanon are because of problems with those states' governance, problems with the, the various disruptions that have happened in the region recently, et cetera, and that the progress on Palestinian statehood, autonomy, et cetera, especially within the constraints of what's really possible, is kind of orthogonal. And so the reason that there's people are not saying, God, we're encircled, we need to make deals now, is they, they don't seem too related. And one other point is, or one other kind of question is, and I think maybe on the right in Israel, they do see a link, but in the opposite direction. And they, as you all know better than I, they point to the Gaza example and they say, actually, especially in the wake of all this turmoil and all these trends, loss of control over the West Bank, 
people will celebrate it for 30 minutes and then 45 minutes from now you're going to have a, a, a land that's, even if it's not most of the Palestinians who are living in the West Bank too, it's going to become a fertile soil for extremists from all those other locations to come in and suggest. So the left and the center kind of think they're just unrelated and that's why the problems outside don't drive negotiations on the West Bank and the right say, well, they're related in the other direction. Is that fair? I'm not an expert on, the, on this region. No, I think there's some truth to both, um, uh, you know, to both of your hypotheses. And, you know, when I introduced the statistic before about, you know, most Israelis believing that actually, A, nothing that they do affects anything, you know, particularly with respect to the peace process, um, and, and that you know, very few Israelis believe that there's any prospect for progress on that because they don't believe that there's anyone to make, you know, a deal with. It's not unrelated to, um, uh, to the way in which you framed, uh, you framed the view. And I think, you know, that doesn't really change until, um, in, until the Israeli public feels as though there's been some kind of meltdown and they are seriously threatened. And the thing about the Gaza war, you know, one of the, the sort of bizarre, um, I don't know, quirks that emerged from it was that uh, we worked with the Israelis and paid for a brilliant anti-missile system it's called Iron Dome. Uh, it was it was successful beyond anybody's imagination in terms of its ability to take down all those rockets. And uh, you know it it's got a very good computer inside it, which just decides okay which one of those things is actually going to hit something that we don't want it to hit, and which of them are just going to land somewhere we really don't care. So the number of missiles that actually need to be intercepted is relatively small. So it's very successful. Um, in the in conversations I had with Israelis after that episode, and um, uh, just things I picked up in the Israeli press, uh, it was evident that you know Israelis basically thought that. The whole thing, I mean, except for the Israelis that lived in Sterot and some of those southern communities, you know, around Gaza. Most Israelis thought that the, the Gaza episode was no more than a trivial episode. It really didn't threaten them. And it didn't affect anything about their way of life. And it didn't affect, you know, their ability to go to a cafe and have a coffee or go to a restaurant and eat out or go to a movie or send their kids to school or anything like that. It just didn't make a difference because now they had this great system that had the effect of, you know, deterring Palestinians by denial, basically. And, um, you know, there are some who'd say, well, you know, if a crisis had been precipitated by, you know, an avalanche of missiles actually hitting, um, uh, Israeli cities, well then that would have been a kind of a wake-up call. Now I think that's kind of, that's a bit grotesque because, you know, it entails, you know, wishing for civilian casualties in a conflict in a, in a way that we wouldn't, we wouldn't wish for. Um, but the underlying thought, namely that, um, you know, conditions that foster complacency, foster complacency, and, um, uh, you know, therefore, a lack of interest in pursuing opportunities or creating opportunities for deals um, uh, when there's no, um, you know, serious threatening reason to do so. Um, yeah, back to the uh, economy. Um, will this go new government be able to actually improve the economy, would they be to work together to improve the economy and what might they do? Um, and my other question is uh, regarding the many foreign nationals in Israel who are not on a citizenship 
trap, whether they're Filipinos or Sudanese or whatever, a lot of refugees, um, immigrants, whatever. And does did their presence uh, play any role in this election um, at all? Was it talked about? Or do they have any political power? Yeah, on the economy. You mean the, the Israeli economy? Yeah. Right. Well, you know, they've, they've got some big problems. They've got a $10.5 billion deficit. Um, it's like, what, 6%? And it's 4% of GDP, uh, which is big by Israeli, recent Israeli, you know, standards at any rate. Uh, they have to deal with that. And they have to deal with these underlying social concerns, essentially distribution, you know, wealth distribution issues that have animated such a large part of the Israeli electorate and that got Yair Lapid into office. They do have to deal with that. It's going to be very difficult to do because there's no common vision. I mean, you have fiscal conservatives like Netanyahu um, who are going to be sitting in a government with, um, uh, you know, Yair Lapid. It's not an easy fit. And I don't think that they're going to be able to make creative policy and really deliver in that domain any more than they're going to be able to deliver in the security you know, domains that we've been talking about. On the immigration issue, a couple of things. First, you know, the Israelis um, uh, are in the process of building a really big fence, uh, it, it, allowing for terrain, I'm exaggerating a little bit, so, but more or less from a lot to Gaza, you know, that line that separates Israel from Egypt. Um, uh, because they're very worried about immigration. It really, um, you know, it bugs them. And uh, the, uh, the African immigrants had become the target of a lot of hostility in Israel because whether they were or not, um, they were blamed for an increase in crime, street crime. So it's become kind of an issue. Um, but it wasn't a huge issue in the campaign. You know, strangely maybe, um, but it wasn't because I think that they think that they'll get a handle on it with the fence and 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 so forth. Yeah, so, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that the Israeli government is trying to build a fence. Do you foresee any changes in the relationship between the U.S. and Israel over the next four years? I think um, you know things could get tense. Uh, if you have events like well, you know, we could sit here together and probably come up with a list of a good half a dozen things that uh, would be difficult um, uh, for the U.S.-Israeli relationship to absorb, although I'm sure it would. Um, uh, one is Iran. Uh, if uh, if the Israelis decided to go for it uh, on their own, I think there'd probably be some unhappiness, you know, in Washington, um, as there would be unhappiness in Israel for America's uh, failure to collaborate, you know, in the effort. So that's uh, that's a potential problem. Uh, if you had another intifada, you know, in uh, you know, in the West Bank uh, that was put down uh, with um, uh, excessive uh, use of force. I think that might um, uh, generate some tension in the relationship. And if you had, um, you know, there are things presumably the Israelis could um, do to protect their interests in Sinai uh, that would create serious problems for uh, the new Egyptian president, uh, Morsi, uh, in ways that would put the U.S. on the spot and maybe generate a bit of tension. So you could think of, of things that, that would, would create problems. But, you know, the relationship, the U.S.-Israeli relationship, is so, uh, remains uh, so deep and abiding that it's hard to see any of these issues really somehow wrecking it. Can I add one uh hypothetical to that list. Um, the cranes move in, the buildings start going up in E1, in that very sensitive area yeah. uh, on the West Bank.
Well, um, you know, the, the Israeli declaration of intention to build stuff uh, in E1, uh, the E in E1 just stands for Eastern. It's just because that's the direction it is from, uh, from the old city. Uh, but in that corridor, uh, it generated some serious um, uh, dyspepsia in Washington. But, you know, and it, it would have in any event, but it was the, um, it was the timing because there had just been a vote in the General Assembly which awarded um, uh, the Palestinians non-member state status, which we and the Israelis had opposed, but you know, almost no one else on the face of the globe, as it turned out. Um, but uh, the U.S. went, uh, you know, went the extra mile for the Israelis um, in trying to stem the tide. And when it didn't go in the right direction, um, the United States uh, asked of Israel that in the immediate wake of the vote, it exercise restraint. And by restraint, one of the things we had in mind was not getting out there and saying, you're going to build an E1. Uh, but uh, that was uh, the virtually immediate Israeli reaction. Uh, and um, uh, it was done with what was perceived on the Washington side um, without a prior warning. So there was a kind of a bruised feeling. And um, you know, I think it was the context that made that um, you know, so, uh, so difficult. But, uh, and it would have been difficult anyway, but it was, it was, more, um, it was more abrasive uh, than it might have been otherwise. It's, it's been said, and I don't know if it was by President Obama himself or somebody else, but that he is the best friend Israel has ever had among American presidents. So I wonder, from your perspective of having served on the NSC under uh, this administration, could you say a little more about the president's attitude toward both Israel and toward Netanyahu? Well, you know, what he thinks in his heart of heart about Netanyahu, I really don't, I've got no idea. Um, uh, and uh, it wouldn't behoove me to speculate. Um, but I can't say the following. You know, first, on whether the U.S. under Obama is a friend of Israel or not, um, U.S. security assistance across the board is bigger uh, under an Obama administration than it's ever been, period, ever, um, and by a significant margin. The cooperation in the security sphere, and I'm talking intelligence and military and also diplomatic cooperation, is, I mean, you know, I'm not sure I have the vocabulary to describe just how intimate and thoroughgoing and, and unreserved uh, it is. Um, uh, you know, so if that's what allies are for, the Obama administration uh, has um, greatly strengthened the alliance. Now, there's a difference of view on how Israel should handle its security challenges going forward. I'm going to leave Iran for the moment, you know, on the on the shelf. I'll get to that in a second. But they, that difference of view is can be expressed really simply. Obama thinks it's going to get worse, and that if Israel doesn't take steps now, particularly regarding the Palestinians, particularly regarding the Palestinians which, as you pointed out, maybe some Israelis or maybe many Israelis don't see connected. Um, but if, if they don't do this, 
then they're going to miss an opportunity to diminish some of the challenges and slow the rate at which things get worse. Now, another example is making a deal with Turkey in the wake of the uh, Mavi Marmara you know, episode, you know, the flotilla takedown that resulted in the deaths of some Turkish nationals and you know, precipitated a big split between Israel and, uh, and, and Egypt. You know, the Israelis could have fixed that by using the A word, you know, apology, um, but they didn't because they were domestic political pressures on Netanyahu that just deterred him from doing that. The unwillingness at that point to confront those political pressures meshed with what someone here called um, the Israeli fatalism about their situation, which in this case meant Turkey is going to turn into an enemy anyway. Erdogan hates us. So even if we did what you say is a sensible thing and use the A word, it actually wouldn't help. So there was no you know, impetus to, to go down that road. But from you know, an Obama-type perspective, that's exactly what they had to do because things are just going to get worse and you have to slow it up. You've got to do fire breaks. That's, that's really, you know, the difference. Um, it's not very complicated and it just has to do with differing strategic worldviews. If the United States were in Israel's position and Obama were the president, well, that's what he would do. So that's what he uh, endorses as a course of action uh, to Netanyahu and on uh, Iran, um, you know, the president's view was right now we have a program of uh, diplomatic uh, and economic sanctions, um, serious export controls that are being enforced, and a covert action program that you could read about, you know, from David Sanger in the New York Times, that's all really active, and it's slowing them up. Let's see what happens. It's too early to bomb because it is too early. Let's wait and see if this is really going to be necessary, and then if it is, we'll deal with it. But right now, it's premature. But the Israelis in the United States had a very different sense of the timeline, or at least Prime Minister Netanyahu had a different timeline in mind than, um, than President Obama. And maybe that difference owed only to differing threat perceptions. The United States is a pretty big country. Uh, we are capable of squashing Iran like a bug if we really wanted to. I mean, I'm being coarse, you know, but I, the, the power disparity between Iran and the United States is, is just towering. It's incalculable. It's beyond measurement. There's, it, 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 we're two completely incommensurate countries in terms of our capabilities. So. For us, the Iranians are never going to be the kind of existential threat that they are to the Israelis. But the Israelis, of course, is very different. So, you know, there's a different sense of urgency, you know, that emerged. But the two countries have both enunciated the same principle with respect to Iran's nuclear program, which is that an Iranian nuclear weapon is unacceptable. The president is so far out there on that. He's been so explicit in terms of that principle and in terms of his rejection of containment as a way to manage a nuclear-armed uh, Iran that um, you know, I think it would be uh, imprudent to question 
uh, you know, his sincerity or his intention on that score at this point. And that's what, of course, we tried to um, uh, convey to uh, the Israelis and to Netanyahu, that actually we are there with them on that question. But making a war on the Islamic Republic of Iran when you don't have to ain't great strategy, you know, from the president's perspective. You, you had your hand up before, and I forgot to um, get back to you. I yeah. liked it. Sorry. Why, why is it everyone wants to take your question? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to ask, I mean, as an Israeli, I've heard a lot of family back home talk about um, how they don't really like any of the candidates, and they're just sort of voting for Netanyahu because they don't feel like they have much of a choice in the matter, and that they're just, I mean, there's corruption in virtually every government, but especially in the Israeli government. Um, and I was wondering what you thought about that and if that impacts the way, um, you know, Israel takes its policy. <laughs> That's what I hear from a lot of Israelis, too. Now, you know, they looked at all these unappealing choices, and a, a lot of Israelis I know who would never, who say that they would never have dreamt of voting for Netanyahu 10 years ago, or you know, in the in the late '90s, mid late '90s, you know, are prepared to vote for him now because they don't see a lot of alternatives. Now the fact is, a lot of Israelis did see an alternative in Yair Lapid, because, you know, his share of the vote was way more than anybody expected, and I think it was because a lot of Israelis, like those in your family who last time around voted for Netanyahu because they really didn't see an alternative and were probably prepared to do so again, suddenly apprehended, you know, that they actually, they did have an alternative who talked a good game. And, you know, it was Lapid. Now on the security issues, going to the policy piece of this, you know, that's not going to have you know, a huge impact because if you uh, examine uh, Lapid's foreign policy positions, this will take exactly a nanosecond out of your life. Um, you know, uh, he doesn't want Jerusalem divided, and he doesn't want to make territorial compromises. He wants to keep the settlement blocks, basically, all the big settlement blocks, including Ariel, which, as you know, projects deep inside the northern West Bank. Um, and, and would disrupt the contiguity of any potential is, you know, Palestinian state. So that's Lapid's you know, peace policy, and that ain't going to wash with the Palestinians. So you know, the, the impact in that domain of, of a Lapid, um, uh, a big Lapid role in, a future Israel, in the next Israeli government, um, you know, it's not going to be much there. I think we're, we're basically at the end of the show here, folks. Um, but how many people still have questions? And perhaps we could have them state them all quickly, and then you could answer them even more quickly. How many were left? I saw a few hands go up. One. Rabbi Boris? You know, it's clergy. You have the benefit of the clergy. So if you'd like to ask a question. But, but let's get them all together then, OK? You mentioned before uh, the Palestinians long between the negotiations that first they want to things up front from the Israelis and they're just not going to get the cost are too high because they want to stand in the silent freeze and then later added the recognition. Could you just speak up just a little bit? Sorry. Um, you said that the Palestinians want things up front before negotiations from the Israelis which the cost of the Israelis were just too high, namely a settlement freeze and then they later added recognition of 48 armistice lines. No, it's 67 with swaps. Was Six, sorry, 40, 67 with yeah. swaps. Um, but you never touch on how we could um, create a situation where they would return to negotiations, maybe without these very costly, um, before the fact, concessions by the Israelis. One sec. Rabbi Boris, do you have a question? Oh, um, well, the only, uh, I, I was intrigued by some of the data indicated about a young people and a sense of discouragement 
uh, and uh, with regards to government institutions, and I was reflecting on that, and then it was, it was either you or uh, I think which one that talked about the great leaders of the past and the lack of inspirational leaders in the present today. Do you see uh, a relationship between that element of discouragement uh, that young people have regarding governmental institutions, um, uh, indeed democracy, and then perhaps emerging a, quote, strong leader who would get the kind of support where Israel would be proactive because Israel is by its very core a kind of proactive country, you know, and now it's sort of sitting back and being, do you see any things on the horizon that could possibly move it to a proactive thing because its very nature over the years has been one of being proactive, 67 war and so forth. Um, now there's this feeling like, well, there's not much we can, the kind of helplessness, the kind of Jewish helplessness, so to speak. Do you see that, you know, do you see uh, any elements of a change um, uh, on the horizon relative to leaders that could be a little more inspirational within a democratic uh, Israel? Do 45 seconds. <laughs> um, if, okay, if I understood your, your question correctly, I didn't, I didn't hear every little bit of it, but it's, is, is there a way to create uh, circumstances for renewed negotiation in the absence of these preconditions? No. Um, <laughs> can I say? <laughs> um, uh, 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 Abbas has had it. And which is why he's insisting on these on these things, um, and that's there's a longer answer, but we're constrained. Um, uh, on, you know, my my friend and and colleague and former peace process negotiator Aaron Miller is writing a book. <laughs> on can there be a great president? It's going to be a really interesting book, um, so watch for it on Amazon. But, um, you know, his, his answer, you know, is no. And because, you know, we're, uh, you know, the incredible shrinking race of, um, uh, you know, of, of politicians and, and voters for that matter. Um, so that's one thing. But what, what, something you said reminded me of um, something that Levi Eshkol, who was the Israeli prime minister, when the 67 war broke out, what he said was he, what he, how he referred to the general staff who were all kind of like wringing their hands. And he referred to them collectively with a Yiddish phrase. Levi Eshkol thought in Yiddish. I mean, he spoke Hebrew, but he thought in Yiddish. Um, and, it, and the phrase was Nebuch Dicker Shimshoin, which means a pathetic Samson. You know, when you talk about the Jewish helplessness, but these, this is a country actually that it is, it is the military power in the Middle East. There, there, there's, there's no close second. They've got hundreds of nuclear warheads. They've got a proven army. They've got an air force that can strike thousands of miles beyond its borders with devastating effectiveness. They have a country where 91% of the youth polled on this question say they want to be in the army. There's no problem with recruitment. I mean, they have a draft, you know, but I mean, there's no problem with people showing up, uh, you know, when they're, when they're called. Sure so. so all this is true, okay, but they're afraid, you know, they don't really know what to do. It's a Nebuch Dicker Shimshon thing. Um, and uh, it's obviously not new if it, uh, you know, if the phrase originated with Levi Eshkol. Okay, and on that, um Colorful note. Uh, I want to thank you, Steve. Um, you know, when I um, we, we left government um, twice now at the same time, and I felt that I uh, recharged a lot in the period between uh, sort of 2000 and 2009, and that it was time to recharge again when I left. And I can see that uh, you need no recharging. Uh, you know, what are you going to read now? Um, anyway, I want to thank you for uh, an incredibly insightful talk and more command of the data than I think um, 
anyone else I know uh, could possibly muster. So thanks for coming up to the far north and for being, uh, well, my first guest here. So I'm, I'm uh, delighted. Thanks very thanks. much. It was a real pleasure.